The latest edition of the Crosstown Shootout was played Saturday afternoon, and the first punch was the most decisive as number 21 Xavier jumped no. 11 Cincinnati from the start and went on to win by the final score of 8,976. Trevon Bluiet, who scored 40 points in last meeting, led the way with 28 and Kareem Cantor added 17 off the bench for the Musketeers. While some Xavier turnovers led to Cincinnati making a run in the second half, the Bearcats were unable to truly threaten the Musketeers down the stretch. Here are four takeaways from Xavier handling Cincinnati its first loss of the one Xavier turned the tables after getting dominated on the glass in last meeting. Given what happened in Cincinnati's 8,678 win, with Mick Cronin's team controlling the rebounding department, it wasn't difficult to figure out what Xavier's point of emphasis would be going into the rematch. And the musketeer big men stepped up to the challenge, as Kaiser Gates grabbed 10 rebounds while also scoring 10 points and counter chipped in with 17 points off the bench. Outside of Gates the effort on the glass was a collective one, with Tyreek Jones, Najee Marshall and Sean O'Mara grabbing four rebounds apiece and Quentin Good and ten points, eight assists finishing with five. In last meeting Cincinnati finished with an offensive rebounding percentage of 47.4%, while Xavier managed to grab just 28.1% of its misses. Those second-chance opportunities made a difference then, and that was the case Saturday afternoon as well. This time around the Bearcats managed to corral just 22.0% of its misses, while Xavier finished with an offensive rebounding percentage of 41.9%. Two Cincinnati will need more from Kyle Washington moving forward. Washington entered Saturday's game averaging 10.4 points and 5.6 rebounds per game, and while those numbers are lower than what the fifth-year senior produced in 201,617 12.9 ppg, 6.8 rpg he's still been a consistent contributor for the Bearcats. That was not the case Saturday, as Washington played just 15 minutes and went scoreless 0 for 4 fg with just two rebounds. Gary Clark and Trey Scott held their own on the boards, grabbing seven rebounds apiece. That being said, given the number of contributors in the paint for Xavier this was a game where Cincinnati needed more from Washington. He's certainly capable of better performances, so it would come as no surprise if he were to bounce back from Saturday's outing in short order. 3. Cincinnati is too talented to settle offensively as it did for much of the first half. While Xavier's excellent execution was a big reason why the Musketeers were able to jump out to a big lead, Cincinnati's offensive issues did not help matters for the visitors. Far too often in the first half the Bearcats settled for challenged shots, on a couple occasions passing up open catch and shoot opportunities to dribble into a tougher shot. Cincinnati was better in this regard in the second half with Jacob Evans 3 scoring 22 of his 23 points in the final 20 minutes and Jaron Cumberland 15 points getting going as well. If not for the production of Clark 10 first half points and Kane Broom 12 first half points, 16 for the game in the first half, the outcome could have been much worse for Cincinnati. While Wyoming should be a contender in the Mountain West, Saturday's game at Xavier was Cincinnati's first major test of the one lesson the Bearcats should take out of this defeat is that they've got too much offensive talent to not be greedy on offense. 4. Trevon Bluey It looked like his old self after two quiet outings. After scoring at least 20 points in each of Xavier's first five games, Bluey It scored a total of 21 points in games against Arizona State and Baylor. Bluey It's been dealing with a lower back issue dating back to last week's Las Vegas Invitational, but he looked to have that spring in his step against Cincinnati. Bluier had it all working in the first half, hitting open jumpers and getting to the basket off the bounce as well. Bluier shot 7 for 14 from the field, 5 for 10, 3 pt and 9 for 11 from the foul line in what was an efficient performance reminiscent of his first five outings this. When the back isn't an issue Bluier is one of the toughest defensive matchups in the country, because of his ability to find and make shots from anywhere on the court. Dallas App, Ben Emelogu had 11 of his 16 points in a big go-ahead run after half-time and SMU got some measure of revenge with a 7,255 victory over No. 14 Southern California on Saturday night. Shake Milton added 22 points for the Mustangs 72, who stretched their home winning streak to 28 in a row. Jimmy Witt had 14 points and Jerry Foster 13. Kaimezi Metu had 13 points to lead USC, which had won its last seven non-conference road games.
It was the third meeting in 13 months between the teams. The Trojans 42 won both games last year, including a home game in November 2016 and then again in the first round of the NCAA tournament last March. The Mustangs are 310 at home under coach Tim Yankovic, including three games when he filled in for Larry Brown when he was still an associate head coach. SMU was down 3,733 before Emilogu hit a three-pointer that ignited a 235 run. The Mustangs went ahead to stay after Milton's two free throws with 1531 left made at 3,837. Emilogu had three threes and a dunk in the stretch. After Metu's dunk with just over seven minutes left in the first half put the Trojans up 2,517, they went nearly five minutes without scoring until Metu's jumper with 214 left, and they still led 2,724. USC was up 3,027 at the half after a late three-pointer by Jonah Matthews. Big picture USC a tough week for the Trojans, who were 40 before losing consecutive games to teams from the Lone Star State. USC was coming off a 7,559 home loss last Sunday to Texas A.M., which took over that game with a 193 run in the second half. USC again struggled shooting, especially after half-time when making only 8 of 22 shots against SMU. SMU The high-energy Mustangs thrive in Moody Coliseum, where one of the regular attenders is former President George W. Bush, who was sitting courtside again Saturday night. SMU is 467 under Yankovic. Up next USC will be in Staples Center next Friday night to play Oklahoma. SMU goes to the other side of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex to play No. 23 TCU on Tuesday night. Devante, Graham and La Gerald Vic combined to put on a clinic on how to beat a 23 zone as No. 2 Kansas cruised to a 7,660 win over Syracuse in Miami. Vic went for 20 points, 8 boards and 7 assists, but it was Graham that was the real star on Saturday. For the second straight game, Graham, who entered the weekend averaged 15.8 points and 8.5 assists for the undefeated Jayhawks, finished with 35 points, adding 5 dimes and making 7 threes, which helped boost his 3-point percentage from 36% to 41%. I think it's safe to say that Graham's slow start to the has come to an end. The question for Kansas now is whether or not they are ever actually going to get another big man on the roster. It's not going to hurt them when Clay Young plays 12 minutes at center against Syracuse. It will once they get into the meat grinder of the Big 12. The rest of Saturday's stars Trevon Bluey at shook off a 12-game slump to pop off for 28 points as no. 21 Xavier put a whopping on number 11 Cincinnati, 8,976. That was before the post-game fireworks. Jalen Adams had 31 points on 13 for 22 shooting as UConn squeaked out another overtime win against a mid-major, this time picking off Columbia. I'm beginning to think Adams is the only good thing about the current UConn program. Shake Milton had 22 points and 9 assists as SMU handed no. 14 USC their second straight loss, 7,255. Drexel's Tramen Isabel had 35 points, 13 boards, 3 assists and 3 steals in a come-from-behind win over Ryder. I feel like I should mention that he's 6 foot 1. 5 foot 10 Fats Russell came off the bench to score 20 points for the second straight game as Rhode Island picked off in-state rival Providence. Team of the day last Friday, number 21 Xavier was embarrassed by then and ranked and now no. 20 Arizona State, giving up 102 points and trailing by as many as 25 in the second half despite leading by 15 just before halftime while allowing Tra Holder and Shannon Evans to look like the reincarnation of Stephen Curry and Allen Iverson. It was, as they say, a molly whopping. But that seems like so long ago after the week that Xavier has had. After picking off no. 16 Baylor in the center's center of Wednesday, the Musketeers smacked around their arc arrival, no. 11 Cincinnati, in the crosstown shoot it, arguably the most intense rivalry in college hoops. They won 8,976, but that number doesn't quite let you know just how thorough this win was. Xavier was up by 10 by the first TV timeout. They were up by 23 points early in the second half. Cincinnati never really them on Saturday. It was so bad that the loss coupled with the incessanting of professional heel JP. Macura had Mick Cronin looking to fight after the game.
A win over your rival as their coach embarrasses himself publicly is a pretty good day. Game of the day no. 20 Memphis lost to number 14 UCF in a triple overtime thriller, 6,255. It was in football, but I feel like I should mention it here because Memphis is, apparently, now a football school. Toby Smith's team sold 4,113 tickets in an 18,000-seat arena to see his Tigers win in double overtime over Mercer. I'm old enough to remember when they used to sell out the FedEx Forum. The football program just played for a league title. The basketball program, even though it has first-class facilities, a $3 million coach and strong natural recruiting base, has zero top 150 prospects and is about to play a home game in front of 2,000 people. So you tell me. Gary Parish at Gary Parish Ob's December 2, 2017 WTF of the day Big Ten play started this weekend, and if that wasn't strange enough, this result might be Ohio State 83, Wisconsin 58. In the Kohl Center. For years, the Badgers were just about unbeatable in that building, and not only did the Buckeyes take a 2x4 to the back of the Badgers' proverbial heads, they did so in a year where they were supposed to be rebuilding. Remember, it was just six months ago that Ohio State fired the greatest coach that their program has ever seen. That matter was let go because the program in the eyes of the higher-ups, was too far gone. And now Ohio State is winning by 25 points at Wisconsin when they have an All-American at center. Good for them. K. E. Tabatisjop led the way with 17 points, 11 boards and 5 assists if you were wondering. What else do you need to know? Is Arizona back? The Wildcats, who went from no. 2-2 unranked this week, went into Vegas and left with a 9,188 win in overtime over a good UNLV team. DeAndre Wayton had 28 points and 10 boards to lead the Wildcats while Alonzo Trier chipped in with 29 points. Brandon McCoy added 33 points and 10 boards. Number 8 Wichita State landed their first win over a ranked team in roughly two years as they went into Waco and knocked off number 16 Baylor, 6,962. The Shockers were led by 17 points from Connor Frankamp. The AAC badly needed some good non-conference performances, and Wichita State wasn't the only one to chip in. Houston beat Arkansas by 26 points. Virginia Tech landed an 8,380 overtime win at Ole Miss after trailing by 16 points in the second half. The Hockeys are now 71 on the after wins over the Rebels and Iowa this week, which is why the loss they took at the hands of St. Louis, who lost by 30 to Bolter after trailing 4,213 at the half, earlier this year is one of the most perplexing results of the The Hockeys head to Rupp Arena on December 16. Georgia and head coach Mark Fox have quietly put together an excellent start to the The Bulldogs are 61 after winning at Marquette on Saturday. They also have a win over St. Mary's on a neutral. With games left at home against Georgia Tech and Temple and a trip to Kansas State, the Bulldogs have a chance to put together a really solid non-conference slate. Miami app, Devante, Graham wanted to get into the Miami Heat locker room. That's about the only thing that didn't go his way. Graham matched his career high with 35 points for the second consecutive game, La Gerald Vic added 20 and no. Two Kansas remained unbeaten by topping Syracuse 7,660 in the Hoople Miami Invitational on Saturday night. Graham said he got excited seeing photos and banners from the Heat Championship runs, and the inspiration from being on a court where Jayhawks legend Mario Chalmers and LeBron James, his favorite player, helped the Heat win NBA titles in 2012 and 2013 showed. It's still nice to play in these type of arenas, Graham said. Graham shot 10 for 17 from the field and 7 for 13 from three-point range for Kansas 70, which is off to its best start in seven years. We're better when we have balance and he'd probably agree with that, Kansas coach Bill Self said. But on a night where basically we didn't have much going on, he needed to do that. He picked his spots well. TYU's battle scored 22 points for Syracuse 61, which was playing away from the Carrier Dome for the first time this. Frank Howard scored 15 and O'Shea Brissett had 13 for Syracuse. Kansas made 11 3s but needed 31 tries to get there. Kansas was averaging 90-something points per game or something, Syracuse coach Jim Boheim said. Our defense wasn't the problem. SVI Mike Iluck added 11 points for the Jayhawks, who shot 49% and held Syracuse to five baskets in the first half.
Kansas used guard Clay Young at times against Syracuse's 7-foot-2 center Pascal Chukwu, and even that worked. I actually thought he did great, 63 guarding 72, I thought he did okay, self said. The Orange trailed by 21 early in the second half before a 162 run over two 12 minutes got Syracuse within 4,942, with Battle and Howard combining for 14 points during that stretch. Graham connected on a deep straightaway 3-2 end that Orange flurry, and Syracuse went cold quickly. The Orange managed only five points in the next six minutes, and Kansas rebuilt a 17-point lead on a dunk by Vic with 739 left. The Orange didn't get closer than nine again, and finished shooting only 32%. This game was a great game for us, Boheim said. It was a great experience to figure out what we need to do in certain situations and when you get down 21 to a team like Kansas and you can come back, we'll learn something there. Big picture Syracuse as of now, this may be the only game Syracuse plays against a ranked opponent until facing Notre Dame on Jan. 6. None of the next eight opponents on the Orange schedule are currently in the app top 25, nor were any of their first six. Dot, dot, dot. Miami coach Jim Laranaga, whose Hurricanes played in the second game Saturday night, spent some time watching Syracuse Kansas, from behind the Syracuse bench. Kansas Graham had 60 points in Kansas's first five games he's got 70 in his last two. Dot, dot, dot. It's still an unbeaten for Jayhawk basketball, not only is the men's team perfect so far, but Kansas's women's team is off to a 60 start. Waiters watches Miami Heat guard Dion Waiters had a rare chance to see his beloved Orange, he played for Syracuse from 2010 through 2012, in person, sitting courtside with Heat managing general partner Mickey Arison and President Pat Riley. He raved about Syracuse's famed 23 zone. That zone's for real? Waiters said, quickly adding that he led the Big East in steals thanks to that zone. Sunshine State as Syracuse will be in Florida at least three times this, this game, plus Atlantic Coast Conference games at Florida State on Jan. 13 and Miami on Feb. 17 This was the third visit by Kansas to the Sunshine State in the last 20 years. The Jayhawks went to Florida in 201,314, and won a tournament in Orlando the following. Kansas hadn't played in Miami since 1990. Up next Syracuse faces Connecticut in the Jimmy V Classic at Madison Square Garden on Tuesday. Kansas faces Washington in the Jayhawk shootout at Kansas City, Missouri on Wednesday. Durham, North Carolina. App, Duke dominated the first half to build a big lead, only to see South Dakota answer with a 50-point second half in the toe-pranked Blue Devils' famously hostile Cameron Indoor Stadium. And for the most part, Hall of Fame coach Mike Krzyzewski was good with that. Grayson Allen scored 15 of his 25 points in an eight-minute opening blitz to help Duke beat South Dakota 9,680 on Saturday in its first home game in nearly two travel-filled weeks. What I saw was a team that put the previous nine games behind them and showed up, ready to play. Krzyzewski said, And I didn't help my team as much as I could in the second half because I subbed differently but that was okay, because we needed to get time for a bunch of kids. I saw us beating a good team today, overall. Duke 100 got its usual strong performances from top liners Allen and freshman Marvin Bagley 3, who had 19 points and 12 rebounds. Duke got a boost from sophomore Javan Delaria off the bench as Krzyzewski took a long look at his reserves in the second half. Duke shot 62% to lead 5,630 by half-time, then maintained a comfortable margin the rest of the way, though South Dakota 73 shot 50% after half-time and made 7 of 13 three-point attempts to outscore the Blue Devils 5,040 after the break. I feel like everyone had good intensity. Allen said, it just kind of dropped off a little bit in the second half when they got 50 points. It's something we have to continue through the whole game. Taylor Hargadorn and Nick Fuller each scored 16 points for the Coyotes, though top scorer Matt Mooney 18.3 points struggled to just 3 points on 1 for 5 shooting with 4 turnovers. They did a great job of making him work for everything. South Dakota coach Craig Smith said, adding, he's seen that before but certainly not against this level of competition. Big picture. South Dakota The Coyotes entered the game ranked 23rd nationally by holding opponents to 37% shooting, but slowing Duke on its famously hostile home court was asking a lot.
The Coyotes fell to 06 against ranked opponents in their Division I era since 2008, though this was the first match-up against No. 1 for a Summit League program that had never played a team ranked higher than 7th in the time before Saturday. Duke Duke had played four straight games away from Cameron Indoor Stadium, the first with three games in the PK-80 Invitational in Portland, Oregon, followed by Wednesday's visit to Indiana in the Big Ten at Challenge. That win capped an opening month that saw Duke travel roughly 8,500 round-trip miles that included a win against Michigan State in the Champions Classic in Chicago on November 14, and prompted Chris Esky to note his team has played much more than it has practiced. Look a 100, and with this schedule, it's been really good. Krasewski said, can it be better? Yeah. Can it be worse? Hell yes. It can be a lot worse. It can be a lot worse. Energy guy Krasewski said Delaria provided a good jolt off the bench. The 6'10 sophomore finished with a career best 13 points to go with 9 rebounds. He also had some hustle plays, such as when he ran over to a corner and dived on the court to force a first half tie up, which brought Krzyzewski to his feet in applause. Sometimes your shot's not always going to fall, Delaria said, but you can always play hard. Allen's flurry Allen made six of seven shots with three three pointers in the early flurry that had him single handedly outscoring the Coyotes midway through the opening half. He made 8 of 11 shots for the game and 4 of 5 3s while also aiding the defensive effort on Mooney. Tops in the USA Bagley posted his 8th double-double of the to tie Minnesota's Jordan Murphy for the national lead. Up next South Dakota the Coyotes host Drake on Wednesday night. Duke the Blue Devils host Street. Francis Pennsylvania on Tuesday night. Lexington Kentucky. App Kevin Knox had 20 points, Hamidou Diallo added 19 and no. 7 Kentucky's 130 run midway through the second half provided a cushion that held off Harvard 7,970 on Saturday. Kentucky 71 returned from a six-day break to shoot well for most of the game and lead the Ivy League Crimson throughout. It wasn't easy, and the Wildcats needed that initial accuracy to counter Harvard's 12 three-pointers, including six by sophomore forward Seth Towns' 25 points, that kept the Crimson within reach. The Wildcats' key run over 242 for a 7,252 lead withstood a cold spell down the stretch that Harvard took advantage of to get within nine on Towns' three with 22 seconds remaining. Kentucky ran out the clock from there to win the first meeting between the schools and earn its fifth straight victory. Shai Gilgis Alexander added 12 points for the Wildcats, who shot 46% but were just 2 of 12 from long range. Towns made 8 of 14 shots for Harvard, which shot 37% but was 12 of 28 from behind the arc. Big picture Harvard just as critical as making all those 3s was a bench that outscored Kentucky 4,426. The Crimson faced a huge hurdle keeping up with the Wildcats' length and speed, factors that made the difference in allowing Kentucky to hold on. Danilo Jurisic had 10 points. Kentucky the Wildcats had a tough task following a 34-point win over Illinois Chicago but seemed capable of handling it in never trailing. But they struggled defending the Crimson from the outside, allowing a big lead to be cut down in the final minutes. The Wildcats owned the paint 4,220 but barely won the rebounding battle 3,736. Up next Harvard hosts Fordham on Wednesday. Kentucky enters final exams before facing Monmouth on deck, 9 at Madison Square Garden.